Welcome to the final lecture. And we're going to introduce a new type of data that will require a new set of analysis tools above and beyond what we've pondered so far in the course. But we're only going to introduce it briefly. Nevertheless, we will consider this type of data now, give you some intuition as to why we need new methods above and beyond the ones we've looked at, and look at some of these methods, examples thereof. So we're going to ponder, why do we need another set of methods above and beyond the ones we had for continuous and binary data when we have time to event data? We're going to talk about event times versus censoring times. We're going to talk about estimating something called the survival curve using something called the Kaplan-Meier method. And we're going to talk about statistically comparing survival curves. So let's start by motivating the need for yet another set of methods by defining the type of data we have in time to event studies. So survival analysis, sometimes called analysis of failure time data, is a broad class of methods, statistical methods, for the study of time to an event. And it's called survival analysis, which implies that the event of interest is death, and that we're interested in studying time to death or survival. But truthfully, this event can be any well-defined outcome. It can be time to remission from a disease. It can be time to imprisonment after being released. It can be time to graduating from high school, etc. So the event can be defined as any measurable, discrete outcome. And the survival analysis techniques account for the times that events occur, for different follow-up times in a study, and for something called loss to follow-up, which we'll define. So to get this started and to introduce this type of data, let's look at an example from the literature looking at the HIV progression, the progression of disease among intravenous drug users. And this is from an article published in the American Journal of Public Health in 2003. And what the authors sought to do in their own words was they sought to examine whether there were differential rates of HIV incidence among aboriginal and non-aboriginal injection drug users in a Canadian setting. And they derived data from two prospective cohort studies of injection drug users in Vancouver, British Columbia. And they compared the HIV incidence, the development of new cases, among the aboriginal and non-aboriginal participants. And their results, they found that aboriginal ethnicity was independently associated with elevated HIV incidence. So those with that ethnicity were actually at a higher risk is what they're saying there. And we'll talk about through the course of these lectures the methods they use to come to that sort of conclusion. They went on to say participants were eligible for this study if they were recruited between May 1996 and December 2005. And then they said, as previously described, the date of serial conversion was estimated by using the midpoint between the last negative and first positive antibody test results. Participants who remained persistently HIV seronegative were censored at the time of their most recently available HIV antibody test prior to 2005, and we'll define censoring in a minute. So let's just recap what they were talking about here. Their event of interest is HIV seroconversion amongst people who were not previously HIV positive upon enrolling in the study. And let's talk about their time frame for tracking the HIV seroconversion among the participants who were HIV negative at the time of enrollment. So the clock starts at their time of enrollment, and it stops at either seroconversion, so we actually see the event, person does seroconvert, has a positive HIV test. It could stop at the end of the study when the person had not had a positive HIV test, but we've ended the follow-up period and we're not going to be monitoring them anymore. Or... They could be lost to follow up prior to seroconversion. The last information we have on them is a negative test. The study hasn't ended, but we haven't seen them again. So what the researchers are interested in here is both the frequency of the event in the groups being compared and the time to the event. So let's just look at a graphic of some possible scenarios, looking at the calendar level clock. For this study. The study begins in May 1996 and ends in December 2005. And the survival analysis clock actually starts when the subject is recruited and enrolled. So let's suppose subject A comes in and zero converts prior to December 2005, three years after he enters the study. So he enters somewhere between 1996 and 2005. 
followed for three years, at which point he zero converts. What do we know about subject A? Well, we know he actually had the event of interest. He actually did zero convert and now HIV positive. And we know how long it took since he enrolled in the study, three years. We have a full piece of information on subject A. We know he had the event and how long it took from the time the clock started. Subject B, however, enters in December 2004, and she does not seroconvert by the end of the study. So what do we know about subject B? Well, we know if she ever does seroconvert, it will have to be more than one year after the date of study entry. So at our last observation when the study ended, she was still HIV negative. We don't know if she'll go on to see or convert after that point. We're not following her beyond that. We do know, however, that if we start the clock when she was recruited for the study, that in terms of the time since recruitment in the study, it will have to be greater than one year to see her conversion if she ever does see her convert. So we have a partial piece of information on her. We don't know her time to see her conversion or whether she actually ever did, but we know if she did, it had to be at more than one year from her entry in this study. How about subject C? He enters in November 1997. He has all negative HIV tests until his last follow-up visit in November 1999. What do we know about him? Well, we also have partial information on subject C. All we know is that if he ever does see or convert, it will have to be more than two years after his date of study entry. Came in in 97, he was HIV negative through 1999, and he never came back for any subsequent follow-up visits. So we know that he didn't see or convert in a two-year period, so we know that his time to see our conversion, if it were to happen, was not one year, was not 1.5 years, in fact, would have to be greater than two years, but that's all we know about it. We have a lower bound on that possibility. Let me give you another example just to illustrate the difficulties in teasing out the information in fully observed events in their times and the partial information. Suppose we have designed a study to estimate survival after chemotherapy treatment for patients with a certain cancer. Patients received chemotherapy between 1990 and 1994 and were followed until death or the year 2000, whichever occurred first. So the clock for them started as soon as the subject finished his or her regimen of chemotherapy. In this study, the event of interest is death. Three results from the study. Patient 1 enters in 1990, dies in 1995. We have a full piece of information on patient 1. They survive five years. We know that they had the outcome of interest. They died five years after finishing chemotherapy. Patient 2 enters in 1991, drops out in 1997. And by dropout, I mean does not come for any further follow-up visits and is not able to be located by the researchers. So patient 2 is what we call lost to follow-up after six years. All we know about patient two is that if he were to die from the cancer, it would have to be more than six years after finishing the regimen of chemotherapy. Patient three enters in 1993, and she is still alive at the end of the study. Patient three is still alive after seven years. We stopped the study. Patient three did not die, did not have the outcome of interest. We know that her death time from cancer, if she is to die from cancer, will have to be greater than seven years after finishing the treatment. We have a partial piece of information on patient three. Well, patients two and three, the ones that we have partial information on, same with patients B and C in the prior example, they're called censored observations. Partial pieces of information are called censored. We lost track of the person before they could have the event of interest. So we have up a lower bound on their possible event time, but we don't have a fully observed time to event. So this is why survival analysis is tricky. On some of the subjects in our study, we get full information. In other subjects, we get partial. And we need a method which can incorporate information about sensor data into our analysis. You might say, well, John, we're dealing with times here. Time is a piece of the story. Why not just treat time as continuous and do things like we were doing before, means, differences in means, etc.? Well, suppose we wanted to estimate the mean time to death for just those three patients, not even the entire cohort of people who received chemotherapy, just those three. Let's start with that. 
what if we just average the three death or censoring times? How would that average compare to the true death time from cancer for these patients? Well, this average of those three numbers would systematically underestimate the average death time for those three persons. Why is that? Because we know that two of the three numbers, those censored observations indicated with the plus after them, are underestimates of the time to death after finishing chemotherapy, as we've defined it. They're underestimates. We say if the person were to die from cancer, it would have to be greater than six years after chemotherapy or greater than seven years for patient three. So what we have is an underestimate of their true time to death. And so if we include those underestimates in our average, our average will underestimate the true time to death. So we can't treat these things as continuous using the times because the censoring times, again, are lower than their true value for that subject that we can't observe. And I say, okay, well, John, why don't we scrap the time idea? We're interested in an event, a binary event, death, not death, CR conversion, no CR conversion. Why not just summarize this as a proportion like we did before Just summarize the total proportion who had the events before the end of the study, treating those who were censored for any reason as non-events. Well, let's consider this in another context. Suppose we designed this study, a study to compare survival after two different chemotherapy treatments for patients with a certain cancer, building on that example from before. Suppose we did a study where we randomized patients with the cancer to one of two chemotherapy groups. And after the assignment, they received chemotherapy at any point between 1990 and 94, depending on when they entered our study. And they were followed until death or the year 2000, whichever came first. So again, pretend we're just tracking whether the percentage or proportion who died in each group, treating those who died as events and those who were centered. Well, suppose at the end of the study, 40% of the patients in each of the two chemotherapy groups had died. Exactly the same proportion in each group. Do we even need a p-value to determine whether the groups are similar or different? So at the outset, 40% of patients on treatment one and 40% of the patients on treatment two had died. Does this show that neither treatment is superior in terms of prolonging survival? In the same proportion had the event of interest, the exact same in our study. Well, think about this. Suppose in the first chemotherapy group, most of the 40% who died, died within a year of stopping the treatment. In the second group, most of the 40% who died, died between five to six years after stopping the treatment. Well, the timing of the event here was very different between the two groups, even though the end percentages are similar. So if we ignored the time element, we'd miss a key part of that story. Yeah, at the end of the study, 40% had died in both groups, but the time it took those 40% to die in each group was radically different and a big part of our story. So we can't ignore the time component either necessarily, or we can miss a key part of the story. So we need another method to analyze time-to-event data in the presence of sensory. This method needs to utilize time in its analysis, but also differentiate between event times, full-time information, and censoring times, the partial time information. This method will produce a summary statistic analogous to a mean for continuous data or a proportion for binary data that captures both the binary portion and the time portion of the story. The method we will discuss in the next section produces the following summary statistic for a sample of time to event data. And it's actually more than a single number. It's actually a curve we estimate from our data called the survival curve, the survival curve S of T. It's a function of time, and what it does is it actually estimates over time the proportion of individuals still in the language of survival analysis, we say alive, but since death is not the only outcome we can look at in these situations, It's the proportion of individuals still alive is analogous to the proportion of individuals who still not had the event at a given time in the study period. And we'll talk about how to estimate this from data in the next section.